morning. Good morning and welcome to Nara Baptist Church. It's great that you can be joining us here on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, where we come together to consider the powerful, life-transforming resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Special welcome to all our guests, our family and friends and those who are visiting perhaps for the first time. It's great that you can be with us here as well. For any who don't know me, my name's Ryan, and along with Andrew, who'll be preaching a little later, I'm one of the pastors here at Nara Baptist. Just as we commence, a very quick reminder about a couple of things. Firstly, there are still COVID restrictions in place, and so whilst we will be able to sing and later enjoy a time of fellowship and some hot cross buns, we are encouraging everyone to practice social distancing as they are able as well as that to maintain good hygiene and particularly using hand sanitizer when you can. Uh, For those who have young kids, if you desire it, there is a uh, parents' room available out the back where this service is being live streamed to a TV in there. So if your little ones and yourself would feel more comfortable in there, please feel free to utilise that. Though, of course, you are most welcome to stay in here with us. And in fact, the children will be joining us for this entire service here together as one big celebration. So please uh, enjoy that. The last thing I will say is for any who are new and don't know their way around, should you need the uh, restrooms, they are out this door around behind us and you'll find them down the corridor. Right now, though, we're going to turn to things of far more significance. So if you have a Bible, either in a paper format or on a device, please feel free to grab it and we'll be heading to Matthew chapter 28 where I'm going to be reading the account of the resurrection of our Lord from Matthew's Gospel. And of course, all around not only our country but our world, Christians will be gathering today to celebrate this momentous event and they will declare together that he is risen. So let us read from Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath, At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way there, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Well, as we come together this day, a little later we're going to be considering some of the evidences for the truth of the resurrection, something to cause you to question and ask, is Jesus truly who he said he was? Or something to bolster your faith for those who've already come to know this truth. Right now, though, I'm going to ask that you would join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come together this morning grateful Grateful for our Lord Jesus and his victory over death. Lord, on this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate his resurrection, as we consider 
its evidences and its significance in our life. We do pray that by your spirit you might teach us, that you might give us eyes to see and ears to hear your truth, that we might turn to Jesus as our Lord and Saviour and follow him perhaps for the first time or dedicate ourselves once more to his service as our Lord. We ask that in this place and amongst us now, Lord, you would be glorified. And we pray it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we continue in our service, let me ask you to turn your attention to the screens and we'll be watching a video about this risen Jesus. Let me tell you a story. You may not believe me. Myself. But I can't dispute what my soul knows. Peter! John! It's all true. Come see this! Everything he said. The tomb! Every impossible detail. It's empty! It's all true. I don't know him. And we stumble along our way. I said I don't know him! But if that day comes, may we remember has been found. What has been defeated? What has been forgiven? What was once dead has new life. What was once old has been made new. What was once finite has been made eternal. May we remember and follow the risen way. Good morning, friends. It gives us great joy to invite you to stand and sing with us. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Saviour, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose. Let's stand and sing with joy.
singing together. And this is a song that our kids especially love. Now, I'm not allowed to have you up the front yet because of social distancing. But please sing and enjoy doing some actions. We haven't had a kid's song for ages. So I'm really excited that today we're going to be singing Boss of the Cross. Now, here's a reminder of the actions for everybody. When we're doing na na na's, we're doing our groovy thumbs. During the verse, you can either click or clap or any other move you like. And when we get to the chorus, here's how it goes. Sin didn't stain him. Death couldn't claim him. He rose again. He's boss of the cross. See God raise him. Everyone will praise him. Mighty Jesus, boss of the cross. And every time we're singing boss of the cross, we're going to do our fist pump because Jesus is the boss. Let's sing together, Boss of the Cross. seated. Good morning, church. For those who don't know me, my name is Max. I'm one of the congregants, part of the congregation. And it's time to come before the Lord in prayer. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we are so aware before whom we are standing. The risen Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, 
God of creation, we come and bow before you, acknowledging your greatness and your glory. No one compares to you. No one is your equal. We look at your creation and marvel at the infinite power and wisdom that is yours. Nothing, absolutely nothing is beyond your reach. You are the one who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. And because of your great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. You are the one who has pitched a tent for the sun. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Where indeed can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? If we go to the heavens, you are there. If we make our bed in the depths, you are there. You are truly the great and awesome God. So, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his birth, his life, his ministry, and death on the cross. But we especially thank you for for his resurrection as we remember that today. His resurrection, which is our great hope. Death has been defeated. And now we can live with can live a life full of power, full of joy, and abounding in good works. Thank you. Father, we live in such a broken and troubled world. Death and destruction are everywhere. Nations are in an uproar. No one pays any attention to you. Neighbor rises against neighbor and insurrections abound. We have sinned against you, Lord. Against you only have we sinned. Father, We look to you for forgiveness, not only for ourselves, our families, but for our our country, for our world, our broken world. We pray for our missionaries and the Christians in other lands who are facing daily deprivations and perils. We pray for their safety, for great opportunities to be Jesus to their enemies in this broken world. We also pray that you fill their hearts with love for others, that you teach them the wisdom of your will, that you give them boldness to speak about Jesus. And we also pray for protection, especially from the enemy of their soul. Lord, I pray for our church, our pastors, elders, deacons, and other workers. I pray with the Apostle Paul that you, Lord, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give us your spirit of wisdom and of revelation of Jesus that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that our love may abound more and more in knowledge, depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is the best and pure and blameless way to live until Jesus returns. Father, there are some among us who are suffering from life-threatening illnesses. Others are facing life challenges that are too hard to face alone. Lord, we lift them up to you and pray for their needs to be met. We pray for families to be reconciled. We pray for relationships to be healed. And we ask this with great hope in you and a sense of expectation of answered prayer because We ask this in the powerful, unshakable, unstoppable name of Jesus. Amen.
We have another great Easter hymn to sing this morning. Yours be the glory, risen, conquering sun. Endless is the victory over death you won. Let's stand and sing with thankful hearts in praise of our great Saviour and Redeemer Jesus. Bible reading for today is from Matthew 27 and reading from verse 57 through to 66. That's Matthew 27 and reading from Matthew 57 to 66. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might come and steal the body 
and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. It's the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here at Nowra Baptist Church, and it's my privilege to be opening God's Word with you this morning. Let me particularly welcome you if you're new to NBC, perhaps this is your first time with us. We are so delighted that you're with us on this Resurrection Sunday. And equally, if perhaps you're returning to church today, maybe after quite a long time. It is truly wonderful that you're here with us today as we study God's Word. And I pray that this will be a encouraging and challenging time for all of us. Donald Trump's four years in office left quite an impression on the world, didn't they? But one of the enduring legacies of his presidency, in my mind, is the idea of fake news. Fake news. The deliberate spreading of false or misleading information as fact, designed to undermine trust, to cause doubts, so that people are oblivious to the real truth. Now, whilst Donald popularised the phrase and misused it, in fact, applying it to every bit of negative press coverage he received, fake news isn't, in fact, a new thing. I was reading this last week that it dates back to at least 1275 BC, where the Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses the Great depicted the Battle of Kadesh as a stunning victory for the Egyptians, complete with scenes you can see there of him smiting his enemies on the walls of temples that he had constructed when he came back. Despite the fact the battle had ended in a stalemate. Fake news is so prevalent, particularly online these days, that back in 2015, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? It's why they call themselves IFLA, published what became the global standard for detecting fake news. They published eight guidelines that you can see there on the screen in summary form. Consider the intent of the source. Is there there an agenda at play? Read beyond the headline to understand the whole of the story. Check that the authors are real and credible. Do they have a vested interest, perhaps? Check the supporting sources to make sure that they actually back up the claims that are being made. Check the stories up to date, that it's not meant to be a joke, that it's not meant to be satire. Consider your own bias and that of others. Ask the experts. Fact check. Good advice for all of us, I think, as we wade through the barrage of news that we're bombarded with each day, but also useful for us as we consider the reports of Jesus' resurrection here together today. Because, friends, fake news was in the air that first Easter Sunday. 
people deliberately spreading false reports designed to manipulate a crowd to believe the fiction. And so that's what we're going to do together this morning. We're going to apply the fact-checking guidelines of IFLA to the report of Jesus' resurrection that we find in Matthew's Gospel. But we're going to do it perhaps a little bit differently to what you might expect. We're going to start with the fake news, the misinformation campaign, and see how it just doesn't stack up to scrutiny. We find that there in chapter 28 of Matthew's Gospel, from verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you were to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away whilst we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So there's the fake news. There needed to be a reason given for the fact that Jesus' tomb was empty that Sunday morning. And the evidence that was given by the eyewitness sources, those who actually knew what had happened, the Roman guards, well, that didn't fit with the political agenda of the Jewish leaders. So they buy off the guards and launch a misinformation campaign. They come up with a story together that the Roman guards had fallen asleep during the middle of the night and the disciples had come and stolen Jesus' body. Now, you don't really need to apply the IFLA guidelines to smell a rat there, do you? The story just doesn't make sense. Think about it. The guards were asleep. So how on earth did they know that it was Jesus' disciples who had come and stolen the body? How did they know that Jesus' body hadn't been stolen by a UFO? Or that the stone turned into a massive Krispy Kreme donut and Jesus ate his way out? They were asleep. How could they know what had happened? It just doesn't make sense, does it? There's a few other holes in, that, in the fake news, though. And yes, that was an attempt at a donut joke. Let's start by going back to chapter 27, where if you were here on Good Friday, you'd recall that we left off. Where late on Good Friday afternoon, after three o'clock when Jesus had died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, who we're told in Luke's gospel, hadn't agreed with the execution of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea approaches the governor Pilate and asks him for his body, asking for his body that it might be buried properly. Joseph had become a disciple of Jesus and no doubt he wanted to ensure that Jesus' body wouldn't have the same fate as other common criminals just thrown into a pit outside of the city. And having confirmed with the centurion, the one who had overseen Jesus' crucifixion, that Jesus really had died, Pilate gives him the body. Now, it was only a stone's throw from Golgotha, where Jesus had been crucified, to the tomb in the garden. And Joseph takes Jesus' body there to the tomb that he owned. Joseph took the body, we're told, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. 
Joseph and perhaps others, rolled a big stone, to, stone to, uh, tombstone into a trough in the rock at the entrance to the tomb, sealing its entrance, protecting the body. And because it was nearly the start of the Sabbath and it was the Passover Sabbath, a particularly special day, Joseph rushes off. Now, archaeologists have uncovered a large number of tombstones from first century Palestine. Most actually weren't as big as you might expect. They were only about a metre tall and a metre wide. But made of limestone, they weighed a tonne, literally. Far too heavy for Jesus, a, a man who had just been beaten to within an inch of his life. He'd been beaten, flogged. He'd been nailed to a tree. His side had been pierced. Far too heavy for a man in Jesus' condition to lift or to push away. Evidence from the experts, friends, reading beyond the headline, checking out the supporting sources, show us that this rock is not moving easily. And Matthew records another important detail for us there in verse 61, perhaps designed to stop other fake news. The theory that Jesus' tomb wasn't really empty, but that the women had just gone to the wrong one. Having recorded the tomb being rolled, the stone being rolled in place, Matthew reports, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Now that might seem to you to just be a meaningless detail, but when we read chapter 28, verse 1, we discover that it was exactly the same women who went to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday morning. Now, there's no doubt these women would have been filled with grief on Good Friday afternoon. The man that they believed to be the Messiah had been killed. But despite their grief, it just isn't plausible, is it, that the women forgot what tomb Jesus had been laid in. One of the interesting things that we find in Matthew's account is that the fake news, the misinformation campaign, was already in the minds of the religious leaders before Jesus rose. We see that from the request they make of Pilate. They're worried that Jesus' disciples are going to come in and steal the body and claim that he'd been resurrected. The ancient equivalent of weekend at Bernie's. Not wanting death to ruin their plans and just carry on regardless. Now, let me say, there's no sense these leaders actually thought that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. But they knew that he had claimed that he would. This is what we read from verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, the guard that Pilate dispatches there in verse 65 wasn't just a single guy from South Coast Security driving around in a white car like we might expect here, but a fully armed 16-man force of experienced military veterans. Four of these guards would stand alert 
immediately in front of what they were protecting. The other 12, well, they would rest and sleep immediately in front of them. They would rotate in shifts of four around the clock. And if 16 Roman soldiers wasn't enough, Matthew tells us there in verse 66 that the guards put a seal on the stone after they'd ensured that the tomb was fully secure. They stretched a cord across the rock, fastened at either end with a sealing clay. And that clay was then stamped with the official seal of the Roman governor, a public testimony that Jesus' body was there and that no one had gained access. And you know, the ironic thing is when you read Matthew's Gospel, is that all of this achieved the exact opposite of what the religious leaders had hoped. They, they had hoped that G, that was going to stop Jesus' disciples getting in and stealing the body. But they made the tomb so secure, they proved that it couldn't possibly have been the disciples that saw Jesus come out. They went to all of this effort, and yet the tomb still remained empty. You can understand the leader's concern, can't you? They needed Jesus to remain in the grave so that his claims could be proven to be false. And that's because of the simplest objection to the resurrection of Jesus at all, Jesus of all. It's simple. Dead people stay dead, don't they? Now, whilst in the first century, they didn't have big sandstone universities or the scientific knowledge that we have today. They did understand death. And the Romans were ruthlessly efficient when it came to crucifixion. Cicero called it the most cruel and hideous of tortures. The Roman historian Josephus, the most wretched of deaths. The victims of crucifixion didn't escape with their lives. And so if there's one thing we can be confident of, it's that Jesus was dead when he was taken down from the cross. It would take the most decisive of evidence to prove that Jesus was no longer dead, which is exactly what Matthew records for us there at the start of chapter 28 that passage that Ryan read for us at the start of our service. Early on the Sunday morning, the two Marys go to visit the tomb. But rather than finding a sealed stone when they arrive, instead they find an angel there reporting that Jesus had risen. The appearance of this angel had paralyzed the fearsome Roman guards. They were like statues full, filled with fear. Filled with fear when the angel had descended from heaven, rolled away the stone and revealed that Jesus was no longer there. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. The angel declares that Jesus had risen from the dead just as he had said. Now, this wasn't news that the Marys were going to keep to themselves. And so they immediately rush off to tell the disciples, just as they'd been instructed to. And as they're doing that, they come across the decisive evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead. The conclusive proof that this is no fake news. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. 
they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. They saw Jesus with their own eyes. Just as the other disciples soon would, and more than 500 disciples would equally see him over the next 40 days. One thing I want you to notice, friends, Jesus appeared to women. Now, if Jesus' resurrection was fake news, the disciples wouldn't have come up with the idea that Jesus first appeared to women. Because back in the first century, the testimony of women wasn't valid. It would easily be dismissed. It wasn't valid in court. Women reporting the resurrection would not have been the way to establish the validity of the story. But it's what Matthew records because it's what's happened. Friends, I trust that you can see, having considered the evidence that this misinformation campaign started by the Jewish leaders is fake news. As are all of the other counter theories, they just don't stand up to scrutiny. But friends, please see, Matthew doesn't just debunk the fake news. He provides evidence for the truth. All of which leads to one inescapable conclusion. Every impossible detail. It's all true. Jesus really did rise from the dead. Proving the validity of his claims. That he is God incarnate. God in human flesh validating his claims that our past can be forgiven, our present change, and our future be secure. Our past forgiven. That every sin can be forgiven. Every lie, every act of sexual immorality, every mark on our guilt-ridden consciences, forgiven by his blood shed on the cross. Our guilt borne by him. The resurrection proves that to be true, that God was pleased with Christ's sufficient sacrifice at Calvary. The resurrection proves that our sins can and have been forgiven because of the perfect sacrifice of our Lord. Jesus really did pay our sin debt to God. The resurrection proves that. Our past can be forgiven. And our present, changed. Just as Jesus foretold his death and resurrection, he equally promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to those who would trust in him. That same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead, now living in us, transforming us, to be more like him. Our past forgiven, our present changed, our future secure. Before his death and resurrection, Jesus said that he would go and prepare a place for all who would come to faith in him and believe. And his resurrection proves the truthfulness of that claim. That just as he rose from the grave, so too will all who have faith in him. He is the first fruits of our resurrection. The resurrection is no fake news, my friends. It's life changing news, both now and for eternity. Let me pray and give thanks to God for this life-changing news. Our Lord and our God, we gather before you this morning and worship and praise you that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, that death 
could not hold him. That through his resurrection from the dead, a historically verifiable event, that we can be sure that his promises are true. That all of our sins can be forgiven through his sufficient fat sacrifice on the cross that the Holy Spirit can be ours to transform us day by day as we live for you, and that just like he rose from the grave, that we too can have that assurance of eternity in your presence, for he is the first fruits of our resurrection. We gather together our Lord this day and praise you and worship you, that the resurrection of Jesus is no fake news, that it is news that transforms our life. May it do that in each of us, this and every day we pray. Amen. Our final song this morning is one of giving thanks to Jesus for the work that he's done in washing away our sin, in satisfying the judgment of the Father and in making us from enemies into friends. Let's stand and rejoice together as we sing, Jesus, thank you.
let me say again, thank you all for joining with us on this Resurrection Sunday. I trust that as we have considered the claims of Matthew and the account of Jesus' resurrection, those of you who have come to believe that truth have been encouraged in what we have considered today. But perhaps you're someone who is still wrestling with whether or not this is true. If you would like to consider these things further, then next term, NBC has the opportunity to do that in the form of a course called Christianity Explored. It's a short course that runs over seven or so weeks that Andrew, who preached this morning, will be running. Uh, if you would like to sign up for that, the dates haven't been set yet. We're waiting to see who is interested. If you'd like to sign up for that, please come and see myself or Andrew. We'd be delighted to chat through with that a little more and sign you up for that study next term. But what you have all heard this morning is the same true message that has been proclaimed since the moment Christ rose from the dead. And to show you that, I'm going to conclude our service by reading from Acts chapter 2, where Peter, Jesus' best friend, made this very same proclamation. He said, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by, God, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted now at the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and Peter said to the other apostles, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, What then shall we do? Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all whom are far off, all who will call on God. Friends, if this is you this morning and you would like to, for the first time, call on God, then my encouragement is that as we break for fellowship and morning tea, come speak to Andrew and I. We would be delighted to share with you, to pray with you, and to welcome you into our faith. God bless you all. He is risen. <laughs>